The Israeli occupation forces have killed 500 doctors and nurses and paramedics. 500. They have, they have taken prisoner around 200. They have tortured to death at least two senior doctors that I knew. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to welcome you this in the next series, next in a series of webinars, the Stone Cries, Stones Cry Out virtual delegation, building on our in-person delegation to Palestine this past February and March. These webinars this summer are designed to inform and empower our advocacy this coming September 23rd to 27th as we gather in Washington, D.C. for meetings, direct actions, demonstrations, and other important gatherings. We urge you to spread the word widely and join you join us in D.C. in September. I also want to thank my partners for the this series, Kairos USA's Mark Braverman and Doug Thorpe from the Episcopal Bishops Committee for Peace and Justice in the Holy Land in Olympia, Washington, as well as our uh, other sponsoring organizations listed here. Okay, Dr. Mads Gilbert is a Norwegian emergency room physician, first went to Palestine in 1981, and brings even more of a wealth of the last 20 years of annual medical missions working in Gaza's hospitals. Dr. Mads was last in Gaza twice in 2023, but then turned away by the Israeli military on October 8th, 2023. Mads, uh, welcome. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Yep, thank you very much, Mads. We're now at day 264, 37 weeks, almost three quarters of a year of Israel's genocide in Gaza. I've said this often, Mads, this is more than a war on Gaza or on Palestine, but a war on Palestinian history, tradition, and culture, a war against the very idea of Palestine itself, an attempt to erase Palestine from human memory, the very definition of genocide. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, good uh, afternoon, good evening to everyone from northern Norway. I'm sitting in the Arctic part of Norway on 70 degrees, northern latitude, looking out at an extremely peaceful landscape, the Arctic Ocean, birds, animals, not a gun, not a drone, not an Apache helicopter, not an F-16 to see. Uh, I'm so extremely privileged because I belong to the white upper class in the global north. And um, for me to experience Gaza 2024 is an other reminder of how little the global north has understood of its own history of colonization, imperialism, and oppression of other people. Because what we see in Gaza now, it is actually not beyond belief. Because it is part of a legacy that is so shameful and that we have done so little to, um, to understand and to take um, a stand against ourselves as precisely that rulers on the top of the world. Um, that said, of course, what is going on in Gaza now is beyond any comprehension. And I think history will tell us that it's probably one of the worst attacks on humanity, not only on the Palestinian people, but on all of us as humans, because it's violating everything that we thought was regulated after the Second World War. We thought there were rules of engagement. We thought there were other laws than the law of the jungle, which says might is right. We want right to be right. And we thought that the Geneva Convention and the Hague Convention and the human rights declarations and the rights of children and women and all of that was more than paper. But it turns out that with the very strong and active support of the United States and other colonial governments, like most of the EU governments, the Canadian, Australian, British governments, the Israeli war machine and the Israeli 
settler colonial project has been allowed to perpetrate three types of crimes, which we are currently watching live every day. It is the collective punishment, which is illegal, meaning that the siege of Gaza continues, which has been on for 16 years. And I've been in Gaza through all these 16 years, and I've seen the effects of this merciless collective punishment of the Palestinian people, of course, also taking place in the West Bank. So it's the collective punishment, which is illegal. It is the um, ethnic cleansing, which is doing everything they can in their might to force the Palestinian people to leave Gaza by making life conditions and, uh, and living so extremely impossible that the Palestinians in Gaza will have no other option than to leave. And then, of course, it is the genocide, which the ICJ is currently investigating. Many of us think it is fulfilling all the criteria and definitions of a genocide. I am willing to wait for the final verdict of the ICJ, but in my opinion, we are watching a genocide in the making. So to be more more general on, on what is happening on, on, on the, what is it, 257th day or something of this attack on Gaza, I still wake up in the morning feeling sick to my bones because I know that my inbox, I know that my WhatsApp will be filled with new messages from my colleagues, my good friends, doctors, brave Palestinian doctors in Gaza, from friends in Gaza. I've been working there since 1989. And not to forget from the families of the victims of the attacks in 2009 and 12 and 14, during which I worked in Shifa, and I've been following up the children and the families of those we treated together in, in Shifa during these attacks. From all these sources, I get the most harrowing, painful, yet brave messages about how they resist, how they survive, but also about the extreme brutality and inhuman treatment that they are exposed to. Not only extreme and inhuman, but purely sadistic attacks on the human people belonging in Gaza. When I say sadistic, I'm not using that for the first time because it was uh, actually uh, Edward Said who said that first time in 2002, that never in history has a, a people been allowed to perpetrate such detailed sadism against another people in the full light of the television cameras during evening news without being held accountable. And here is one of the, the, the key uh, philosophical, political, and moral uh, dilemmas or, or challenges about Gaza, it is that Israel has never, ever been held accountable through these 75 years of occupation and settler colonial politics for their crimes. Never, ever, until the brave Republic of South Africa took them to the ICJ, and finally they have to stand in front of judges and defend their own position. And this impunity has been so galvanizing for the actions of the Israeli occupation forces that they don't feel they are obliged to follow any international regulations, rules, or even pressure from states that support them. They just keep going on with the murderous attacks, with the starvation, with the thirsting, and with these sadistic ways of denying people right to medical relief, medical support, medicines, antibiotics, uh, orthopedic instruments, uh, surgery, anesthetics, everything you need to treat people who are being injured and, and, and being sick and, and deceased. So I can go into a lot of details about the medical situation, but I, I think we need to keep an eye on exactly what you uh, introduced uh, uh, Michael, which is this eradication of Palestinian culture, of the knowledge of the Palestinian people. This has a name, 
It's called the epistemicide. Epistemicide. It's a fairly new term, and it means the eradication of the knowledge of the indigenous people. And in fact, that has been done by the settler colonial occupiers uh, through history. Like when we, the Europeans, went to the North American continent and eradicated all signs of culture, history, language, and belongings for the uh, indigenous Indian people, American Indians. And, you know, I mean, you can go on China, um, uh, Pakistan, India, and so on, and all the African countries that have been colonized. So I think part of the problem is also that Europe, with its colonial history, has been backpadding and encouraging Israel because it is precisely what it is. It is part of a global colonial system, which is now resuscitated, actually, in a time where we thought that settler colonial brutality and expansion and colonialism was part of history. And here it comes back in its, in its more than ever brutal version led on by Israel with the full support of the United States. So I'm, I'm horrified. And then I'd like to add, this, uh, this is a long answer, but forgive me that. We should not only look at the way that the oppression and the attacks and the killing is going on. We should also celebrate, I would say, the resistance of the Palestinian people, their heroism. And for me, in particular, the healthcare sector, where my colleagues, the doctors, the nurses, the medical students, the nursing students, the paramedics, the pharmacists, the physiotherapists, everyone who is needed for a comprehensive medical system. And Gaza had a comprehensive, very modern medical system, both primary healthcare and, and hospital healthcare. How these people have been standing tall beside their patients, their people, without yielding, without resigning, without ever thinking of giving up. The Israeli occupation forces have killed 500 doctors and nurses and paramedics. 500. They have, they have taken prisoner around 200. They have tortured to death at least two senior doctors that I knew. And they are continuously attacking healthcare, which should be the symbol of humanism in any society. But my, my brothers and sisters in Palestinian healthcare, they have not surrendered. They still stand tall. I talk almost every day with my colleagues, like in Al-Aqsa Hospital, and um, they don't give up. They get hundreds of new injured every day. And they are, they are filled for 500% of their bed capacity. They don't have instruments, they don't have drugs, and they improvise and they find solutions and they go on treating because they know that the healthcare system is the backbone of any uh, civilized society. And it is also a key factor to uphold the willingness to resist. I don't support Hamas. I don't support Fatah or Shihad or PFLP or PA or any um, pa particular Palestinian fraction, political party or armed group. But I do support, like the Norwegian Solidarity Movement, we support the Palestinian people, their, their, their right to exist and their right to resist the occupation also with arms. They have the right, just like the Ukrainian people, to resist the occupation with arms, of course, within the strict limits of international law and humanitarian law. But within that framework, they are entitled to and have the full right to resist and to fight back against the occupation forces of Israel. And that is the problem, that the language has been turned upside down. So the narrative has changed from the occupied being the occupiers, which is not true, and the occupiers and the attackers being the ones who are always proclaimed to have the right to defend themselves. Whereas the irony is that an occupying force, an occupying nation, an occupying people cannot defend themselves. They are actually the attackers, and it is the occupied who are defending themselves. And for me, solidarity is my contribution to support the struggle, the civilian struggle, the armed struggle, uh, and um, the way that the Palestinian people themselves find it best to resist the occupation, just like we support the Ukrainian people. And of course, the double standards of the West are glaring and Divulging, it is sickening to see 
how there is a free flow of arms and money and blockade and sanctions and everything to support Ukraine. Whereas when it comes to the occupation of Palestine, it is precisely the opposite. Double moral, which has again eroded the trust between the people of the global south and the rulers in the global north, in particular the United States and EU. You're muted, Michael. Michael, you're muted. Yeah, thank you, Mads, for that answer. Um, um, we have a number of questions here. I really appreciate the completeness of that answer, and you you anticipate already a number of our questions. We do want to get as many questions in here as possible. You mentioned the human toll, and uh, one of the underreported questions, I think, and as a physician, I'm sure you're very concerned about the invisible bodily trauma, the hidden injuries, brain injuries, the long-term psychological impact of the, the trauma on those who survive. Uh, we also hear about death by suicide because of trauma. The people of Palestine and Gaza are people of faith. They're resilient, as you said. But the psychological trauma imprints itself and remains sometimes for a lifetime. Can, can you share a little bit about the invisible wounds that people will carry with them and what you're hearing from your friends in Gaza? No, I'm not. I'm not sure I want to do that. And... Um... I'll give you a, a little reasoning because I think, of course, I will answer your question, but but let me give some pre uh, uh, preconditions for my answer. Because once we start to look for these more special uh, problems in the situation, and and you know the West is so unused to this kind of massive death and massive. Um, in massively inflicted pain, physical pain, and killing and destruction of the habitat of people's homes and and roads and and and, and you know hospitals, whatever. That we that we don't really see clearly the magnitude of this massive attack on the human fabric of Gaza. So we start to talk about more specific things like phosphorus bombs and uh, and uh, and uh, psychological trauma and uh, and these details, which in a way is dangerous because it tends to normalize the massive brutality of the attack of human life on human lives. Uh, my good friend Dr. Mustafa Barghouti has calculated that with the percentage of people killed or injured in Gaza today, which happens to be, uh, I think it's 2.3% of the population, which is a, an enormous number. Had that been, had that been in the United States, the United States would have had 16 million, 16 million wounded and killed within these seven months. Eight month, 16 million, which is, of course, a, a, a massive, horrendous number. But it gives you an impression of how widespread this killing has been going. And there is a tendency today in the media, and I'm not insinuating that, uh, that you're part of that, Michael, uh, by all means, um, that we normalize this mass killing by not digging deeper into what these numbers actually mean. I'll give you the numbers. It's actually 5.6% of the population of Gaza who has been killed or injured. And that calculates with about 10,000 remaining under the rubble. We don't know that number. We know there are new numbers of missing children, which are very high. So we don't know the exact number. And add to that the ex excessive mortality from normal diseases like diabetes and cancer and psych psychiatric disorders and, and infectious diseases, which we do not, which they cannot count because it's hard to define. But I think we're going to reach maybe around, um, well, now we have 80, now we have 85,000 injured and 37,000 killed. I think we will reach around, cynically speaking, maybe 175,000 to 200,000 killed and wounded. But the numbers we have today, the UN numbers, constitutes 5.6% of the population of Gaza killed or wounded. It's a massive number. It would, 
transfer or, or it would um, uh, mean in proportion 19 million killed or injured during nine months in the United States. Think about that number. 19 million Americans killed in nine months. Or turn it around and imagine, imagine that there had been, imagine that Palestinian fighters had gone into Israel and God forbid had killed 36,000 Jews, had um, killed 500 Israeli doctors, nurses, paramedics in Israel, in Tel Aviv, Jewish doctors and nurses. Imagine that Palestinian fighters, and they would never do that because they have another moral, had killed 15,000 Jewish children. And, and the reason why I, 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 I insist that we have, to, we have to dig deeper into these numbers is that we must avoid normalizing this kind of extraordinary war crimes in a time where we see and know everything from minute to minute, and yet the rulers of the world, the US, Canada, the EU, the UK, do not react sufficiently powerfully to stop it. We said right. in 1949, we said in 1945, never again. And never is never again for everyone, not only for white people. That's our problem today. So what about the psychological trauma? Of course, it's massive. But we know from very good research in Gaza on psychosocial consequences of trauma uh, done by the Gaza Community Mental Health Center together with brilliant researchers from Italy and Finland. Uh, Professor Guido Varanese among them. We know pretty much the factors that protect the Palestinian child against long-term negative effects of this trauma. Because after all, 16 years of siege, six massive attacks, 2006, 9, 12, 14, 2001, and now 2023, 24. We know what the protective factors are. It's first of all, psychosocial support from the family, then it is the faith. Then it is the greater project of a free Palestine, a common national project. And then it is, of course, the individual capacities of each child. But, 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 but bear in mind that the psychosocial support from the family is the most important factor for the child to enter into a path of post-traumatic growth, PTG, as opposed to post-traumatic problems. So... In that, uh, in that understanding, we need to include why are the Israeli occupation armies so systematically destroying the families? Because yeah. precisely the family is is the is the life belt. It is the is the it is the security of the child. It's the future of the child. So they also destroy the families. So I think so these twenty two thousand these twenty two thousand children who are unaccompanied now and without an adult or without a parent, orphan children. I mean, that, uh, that's another one of these statistics that we really need to pay attention to. Yes, absolutely. And it's done on purpose. So for, again, I mean, the dilemma is that the NGO industry, the non-governmental organization industry, they are eager to run into Gaza now because there will be a lot of money uh, hanging around there to rebuild Gaza. We don't know which form it will take. But we, we, we will do, we will add we will add stones to the burdens of the Palestinian children in Gaza and the West Bank if we think that the solution to the orphan problem or the uh, injured child problem or that the child who lost one mother or a father or a sibling is to import a few truckloads or, or air cargoes, airplanes with psychologists and psychiatrists from the West. That's that. There is no solution in that. What is a solution is to reinforce the living conditions of the families, the Palestinian families, to make sure that they have resources to absorb orphanated children, not to export them out of Gaza to a different culture. That is adding disaster to disaster. So, so for the rebuilding of Gaza, the reconstruction of Gaza, we must pay most attention to how the Palestinians themselves want us to support them and not to sit here in Norway or in the United States and prescribe some sort of solution for, for example, the orphanated children problem, 
that we think is right because this is so culture sensitive and and as part of the epistemicide of course the occupiers israel and the united states they want to erase also all the factors that creates the sumud or the resilience of the palestinian society because look after eight nine months they're not fleeing they're not giving up they're not waving the white flag they right. continue to resist You know, you mentioned the heroic efforts of the uh, of the uh, um, uh, medical people, the uh, the doctors and nurses and paramedics and pharmacists and 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 the rest of the staff. I would like for you to say a little bit more about that from your experience, and also along along with them. And I know they've been targeted. You said five hundred uh, medical personnel already uh, killed, targeted killing. I'm also thinking of the Palestinian journalists and bloggers who continue to do their work, getting news out uh, either through TikTok or Instagram or other social media, uh, their heroic efforts as well, because over 100 journalists have been killed by Israeli forces in targeted killing. And so say a little bit more word about these heroic efforts that from your own personal experience, uh, the medical personnel, as well as the, the journalists who uh, remain and survive in Gaza. Yeah. Let me just uh, let me just quote from the, the latest. I hope you all read this. This is the Orcha OPT, Orcha Occupied Palestinian Territory. These are the flash updates that can come to your mailbox three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They are the most comprehensive, updated, numbers from the United Nations. It's a, sort of a sum up in one infographic, one A4 page. And um, it is, it, it's actually quite vital that we are, I've, I've coined a, a term that I call evidence-based solidarity. Evidence-based solidarity, by which I mean we have to base our solidarity efforts on as much as possible exact, let me say scientific knowledge about what's going on. Because it's fine, we walk in the streets and we wave the flag and we shout free Palestine and, and no to genocide. That's important. But what is what is most detrimental to the United States and Israel is, of course, that we know all these numbers exactly and can show, not arbitrary or randomly, but say, for example, journalists, here it says 150, not 100, 150 journalists and media workers are killed. That's one number. The other number is 498 health workers killed. And then it is 197 UN staff, which are UNRWA, WHO, UNDP, UNOPS, and UNDC. And 33 Palestine Red Crescent Society, Red Cross, are killed. So these exact numbers are horrifying numbers because had they been white, it would have been a complete different reaction in the West. Of course, imagine, imagine for a moment that 150 CNN, Fox News, BBC, TRT, uh, Swedish and Norwegian journalists, white ones, had been killed during an effort to cover this, uh, this attack on Gaza. It would have been an uproar. So there is also a deep-rooted racism in the way that we deal with these numbers because we deal with them as numbers and we never reflect or we do reflect but we never actually get outraged by the fact that had these people been white blue-eyed blonde-haired like me every one of them would have been named would have been portrayed by family pictures and the heroic work they had done now it's 150 journalists could you name anyone michael of these journalists no, exactly. Had it been from CNN and Fox News and ABC News and NBC News and, and whatnot, I'm sure you would have known a few of them. So this, again, we have to reflect on, on both this racist. Uh, I'm not saying that any of you are racist, but I'm reflecting on myself, that I need to re-educate myself on my colonial mind. I, re I need to re-educate myself on my, my deep-rooted unknowing lack of knowledge about what Europe has done to the global south through these generations that these generations now remember 
when they see what's going on in Gaza. So to you the know, heroism. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, um, one of the things, one of the strong things that you bring to this conversation, it's easy to toss out terms like settler colonial or uh, 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 some of these other terms that we use, but really this deep racism that's involved uh, by the global north against the global south, the west against the Middle East. I mean, it, it the racist part of this just reeks if you take a moment to to think it through more clearly. And that has to be more and more a part of our solidarity that we talk about these things uh, in these terms. And I UNRWA, think, the work of yeah. UNRWA, I mean, UNRWA is being targeted now by Israel and by the United States and the UK and others. Uh, and, and trying not only defunding them, but removing them from uh, from Gaza and from Jerusalem and their humanitarian efforts. I totally agree. I totally agree. And and it seems like uh, like Israel and the Hashbara has a sort of a library of lies that they can pull out and throw into the to the circulation every time something negative or you know something peaks with criticism of Israel. When did this UNRWA? claims come out it was precisely when south africa launched the case against uh, israel in, in absolutely ICG. and it has never ever been substantiated you know the investigation from the un independent investigation showed no there is no proof israel never ever provided any solid proof for a forensic investigation take shifa hospital <laughs> and the claims that shifa is a military command center Never, ever been proven. I've been working in Shifa for the better part of 30 years. I've never seen any command center there. Of course, they might not have told me about it, but I can roam freely. I've written two books about Gaza. I've written the book Ice in Gaza, and this one, which is also in English, Night in Gaza. All these pictures I've taken myself. I can go anywhere in Shifa where I wanted to go. Take pictures, open doors, talk to people. Never any would, restriction. Would you... and one, one second. I'm sorry. And when these, when these accusations were at the peak, and I guess that was in late November last year, the Hamas government said, we invite an international investigatory, investigatory committee, independent, to come and examine all our hospitals. Totally free. They can go where they want, and they can look for anything they want, and we want them to report back on their findings. Who stopped that? Who stopped that? Israel stopped that. Who stopped the, the international journalists from going to Gaza? Israel stopped them. They demand that they are embedded in the Israeli army. No decent journalist will do that. Why aren't critical doctors allowed in? They stop that because they do not want anybody to report on the truth facts on the ground. And this is part of, of this extremely extremely grave way of denying the world insight and independent reporting. They don't allow any UN reporters. Take the special rapporteur for, for Palestinian uh, occupied Palestine. They're never allowed to go in. Goldstone was never allowed to go in. I mean, they keep the curtains drawn and then they do the killing and the maiming and the torture behind the drawn curtains. Would anybody else be allowed to do that? No. So, so I think I think uh, you know the people that continue to report to journalists. I met a large group of them uh, in Beirut last week uh, in a conference which is called Justice for, for for Gaza, and these are journalists that I've known for many years. Half of them have been killed, and they keep reporting. And 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 then you have the additional problem that if the reporter is not blue-eyed. Uh, pale, white-skinned, and blonde-haired, the West will not trust them because if it's an Arab, it's a terrorist. If it's someone who, who is on the Palestinian side, it's a terrorist. So really, we have a huge political and moral problem with our perception of what's going on, with the narrative that's presented to us and the lack of systematic criticism of the narrative and the access to honest reporting, to put it that way. Could, could you briefly type into the chat, uh, Mads, or, or at least repeat one more time uh, the information uh, about the, the the flyer, the sheet of paper from OCHA that you held up? 
just to, so yeah. that people can uh, can maybe subscribe and receive it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <sighs> or you can repeat it uh, out loud, but uh, uh, either way that works for you. While we're while we're on this, uh, um, uh, isn't it interesting as well that immediately when people start talking about ceasefire. And when the ceasefire seem, you know, when the talks seem to be getting close, Israel then steps up, steps up its bombing. And so just recently, even though there have been talks about another ceasefire, Netanyahu says publicly that the war will not end. Yeah. Okay, so there it is, folks. Uh, humanitarian snapshots from Ocha. In the occupied you, you, Palestinian you, you get, we you get, get the you get the the web uh, address in a second. So uh, here it is, and then you can actually on this web page you can actually subscribe to it. Alrighty, thank you for that. Um, we can look it up too, Mads. We can look up the web page by. Uh, there you have it. There you go. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, so there you have it. And, and folks, really, uh, do subscribe to that and um, and spread my lecture. I actually copy, I copy this one eight a four a. I asked the organizers to have it ready, and when I lecture, I I hand it out to everyone. They can take notes on the back side, and they can bring it down, put it on the fridge wall, or even copy it and deliver it to friends. Because what we need now in the solidarity work. Is that we need to even we we must step up more. So every one of the what is it here now? Thirty three people. If all of you the next week could mobilize two people, we would have you know uh, seventy eighty hundred more people to be active in the solidarity work. Forty three you are two. That's eighty three eighty six. So so. And in that argument, I think we all feel exhausted now. We're emotionally exhausted. There is a term called compassion fatigue, which is an important new knowledge about how if we are compassionate people working in in care, in you know, in in in, in professions that need a lot of compassion, we may reach a level of so much uh, involvement that we get fatigued, we get exhausted. And I, I think for many of us who are so deeply engaged, like I know all of you 43 people are, and I, I deeply appreciate Fosna and, and Sabil. I've been to Fosna meetings in the US. I've been to Fosna meetings in, and Sabil meetings in Al-Quds in Jerusalem. I so much appreciate your interfaith efforts and work, but we get exhausted because there seemed to be no end to the horrors of Gaza. Then I think it's good to have some some fresh, you know, ways to mobilize more people. And I think these fact sheets from from uh, UN and Orchard, and of course also the fact sheets from, from the Minister of Health in Gaza are very helpful in the discussion that we should have with our neighbors, the grocery store who is selling Israeli potatoes with, with our grandchildren, with our, our workmates, with our alumni maybe, to say, how can I find more people who can engage? Because we need more, because the key to this, situation lies in the United States. The key to the change in the occupation of Palestine lies with the people of the United States. And there has been a very fruitful, very promising change in the opinion, as you know better than me, in particular with the young Jews who are denying more and more Zionism and, and IPAC and all that. So there is a movement going on. There is a movement all over the world. We've never seen so much solidarity and so much original and new active solidarity for the Palestinian people like in these last seven months. But still, we need to increase the efforts because the pressure on the United States must be stepped up and you have the key to that. And in particular, the interfaith work, I think, is, is crucially important to, to, in a way, take back, take back all the people who have been misled about what this, what this is all about. It's not about terrorism and, and a terrorist attack on Gaza. It is about actually the right of an occupied people to live in peace and equality against apartheid, against occupation, and against the subjugation 
the genocide and the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. And we have to take part, all of us, because we are at a crucial crossroad in our history, because, as I say, this is not just an attack on the Palestinians. This is an attack on all of us. There are a couple of questions. I'm aware of the time. There are a couple of questions I want to ask specifically because uh, you bring your medical expertise to us um, and from your personal experience. You were turned away uh, from a medical mission on October the 8th. Uh, and yet I, I believe you spent three weeks in Egypt uh, preparing. Two uh, months, uh, Michael. Two months. Three months. Three months. Okay. Two three months. months. Two months. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, working to prepare supplies, all the rest. Talk to us a little bit about, I mean, we, we get reports about what's happening in Gaza. Talk to us about just the preparation and, and the, the whole uh, the strategy and, and the infrastructure of the people who you are working with in Egypt to prepare supplies to enter into Gaza and the frustration maybe of supplies not being able to enter. Yeah, that's a good question, Michael. Thank you. And on the lower part of this A4 page, there is uh, every third day a sum up of the number of trucks entering Gaza. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I guess you know that before this attack on October 8th, Gaza had an influx of 500 truckloads per 24 hours to sustain the life of the 2.2 million people because of the prolonged siege that started in 2006-7. Yeah. Five, bear in mind, 500 truckloads per day with food, with daily, you know, the needs for daily life uh, and fuel and gasoline. And um, since the attack, Israel declared there will be no water, no food, no nothing into Gaza. Gantz, the defense minister, minister said that that first week. And they have kept that cruel, uh, that cruel promise. So the siege has been nearly total. And you've all seen the pictures of the hundreds, if not thousands of trucks lining up at Rafah. And the average has been down to maybe at the most 150 to 170 truckloads per 24 hour, which is, of course, massively insufficient. Because going from a relative steady state situation before the attack, after all this destruction, all this maiming, all these sick people, all this injured, the, the need would be maybe a thousand trucks per 24 hours to sustain life. And bear in mind also that the food basket of Gaza itself has been destroyed. The poultry farms, the dairy farms, the agriculture with vegetables, the fishing, yeah. the fish farms, they have a lot of uh, fish farming, uh, land-based fish farming. And the diaries and the bakeries, all of it had been smoldered. So whatever they had of self-sufficient supplies of food has also been destroyed, also documented in, in this uh, UN report. And uh, what has this led to? Well, this has led to massive starvation, as we know, man-made starvation. All of these effects are 100% man-made. All of these effects, all of these actions are planned and done with full will from the Israeli government and the Israeli army. And that, that's even more painful to think about. How can, how can humans be so evil against humans in such a systematic way? And you have, you have all these you know, high-ranking uh, ex-ministers and officers from the Israeli army who says that starvation and disease, epidemic diseases are good because then we get killed more people and we don't risk our soldiers. I mean, how can you say that in 2024 and get away with it? And and you've seen, uh, well, so these 500 trucks that were needed have been cut down. And from the 7th of May, Israel completely closed off Rafa and Khmer Shalom, which is the, uh, the Israeli crossing points through the fence in the deep south of Gaza. So from there, from the 7th of May, it's been down to zero. And then they have been reopening. And don't let yourself be fooled by these airdrops and these meager influx of propaganda tricks. The fact of the matter is that today, according to UN, 
There are 1.1 million people in Gaza facing catastrophic levels of food insecurity, what is called IPC phase five. I repeat, 1.1 million people facing catastrophic man-made levels of food insecurity. Half of them are children. We see the videos and the pictures of children starving to death in Gaza. And it is not a disaster. It's not a drought. It's not an earthquake. It's not a flooding. It is 100% reversible in 24 hours. Open the gates. Let the trucks in. Let the international community and UN have control with the relief flow. Now it's 100% controlled by Israel. And we know what is even worse, maybe, from a human point of view, that when they are allowing a truck in, that truck has to go from El Arish or from Rafa. They have to go east to Khmer Shalom. They're controlled by the Israeli army. And they take out everything that they consider dual use. And I guess you've seen the reports what they take out. They take out anesthetic drugs. They just leave thiopentone, which is not an anesthetic drug. It's a sleep machine, a hypnotic drug. They take out surgical equipment, like the equipment you need to repair open fractures, the um, external fixation equipment. These are the, you know, the screws that you drill in in a fracture and the, the rods that you connect them with, very modern. You can then save an arm or a leg. They take out that. They've been taking out midwife equipment, like the torches that midwife need to conduct a, a delivery. They take out the oxygen machines. They systematically remove from the few trucks entering these essential parts, which are only intended to save lives. And how can that be allowed to happen without the ministers of culture or health or prime minister, whatever, crying out and saying, we will not allow this. And again, had there been a siege of Tel Aviv, and this was the perpetrator's politics to deny the civilian people, the civilian Jews in Tel Aviv, the right to have anesthesia, the right to have water and food, the right to have medical treatment, we know the outcry would have been massive. And in addition to that, you have seen how they are, how they have been invading, besieging, attacking, bombing, shooting the hospitals in Gaza. And um, one very, very uh, disturbing report, I think, and I've seen the pictures from a delivery hospital in the south of Gaza, where the Israeli soldiers had 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 sort of systematically cut the cables, the electrical cables of the ultrasound machines. Yeah. In the in the delivery department, you, you know, the midwives, they use ultrasound to, to detect how the fetus is, is situated and how the heartbeats are. And this is a that's a vital instrument in modern delivery care. So they go in there and they cut the cables. What kind of military significance does an ultrasound machine have? They smash the oxygen machine and these and they did the same in Shifa. And these attacks are so brutal and so incomprehensibly inhuman that it has to be, as I said, sadism. Now, don't forget that the Minister of Health in Gaza, Dr. Yusuf Abrish, my good friend, pediatrician, has been standing tall through all these eight months as the leader of the minister, the civilian part of the administration in Gaza. Now I get reports that they have actually, the Palestinian Ministry of Health, have been able to partially reopen Shifa with, with hemodialysis in a corner of the medical complex that they managed to fix, and they installed their hemodialysis machines, and they're now doing active hemodialysis of some, not all, of the more than 1,000 uh, fatal renal insufficiency patients in Gaza. They have reopened Nasser Hospital and admitted, I think it's 250 patients. They have reopened the operation room in the Indonesian hospital in the north. They keep reopening and repairing their hospitals as part of what we are not taught or not informed about by the mainstream uh, Western media, namely right. the, the resilience and the, the sumud 
of the healthcare and the Palestinian people. So it's a balanced picture. And we need, you know, most of all, not to look at the Palestinians in Gaza as beggars or, 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 or sort of pitiful people not managing. We need to support their strength and respect them in their, in their incredibly brave resistance, be it a teacher trying to set up a, a tent school, be it a mother trying to take care of five kids when the father has been killed, be it a doctor or a junior medical student doing operations far beyond their capacity, but they have to learn it, or be it part of the, the armed struggle. These people are actually holding the fate and the future of our civilization in many ways, because they fail. We all fail. You know, uh, this hour has just shot by, Mads. Uh, I'm going to encourage any of those uh, folks who are listening and on this call, if if you'd like to get a hold and continue this conversation with Mods, maybe hold your own interview with him. Um, uh, there's so much more that we could have talked about today. Um, I'm going to give you the the last uh, the word, Mods. I want to just do a couple of commercials here and then let you have the final word. Uh, uh, Michael, can I? Can I? I, I mean, <clears throat> I'm 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 flexible. Uh, the other the next session doesn't start until seven uh, fifteen. In uh, oh, okay, good. Right. I, I have, I have, well, then uh, I do want to. I do want to ask you then to weigh in because no, no, we. No, I, yeah, yeah, I just wondered if there were any questions from the audience. Well, the, we we have had. I've included a couple from the uh, from the uh, chat room already, uh, but I did want to mention something. We interviewed uh, a, a, an intensivist uh, and an, a burn nurse specialist on Monday evening, um, uh, who had just returned from Gaza a month ago. And they talked about uh, not only the death that they saw in the hospitals in which they were serving, but also two and three days uh, later, sometimes even successful surgeries, uh, the infections because of the conditions in which they were returning. So the high infection rate also led to complications and even death. Uh, I wanted you to weigh in a little bit about just the infections and and the problems that that causes even after successful treatments absolutely good question uh, michael and i don't know how how much uh, medically interested uh, the uh, majority of our uh, audience is but i can i can tell you this 100% of war wounds are infected from the start they are infected by the dust the sand the stones the shit that is shot into the tissues. So any war wound will need debridement, which means cleaning up the wound once you have stabilized the patient and stopped the bleeding. And it will need debridement once, twice, or three times daily. And debridement means to open the wound again, take off the bandages. You never close a war wound primarily. You keep it open because you need to see what more tissue is dead. And then you have to remove that dead tissue because that is the breeding ground for very dangerous bacteria. Now, all of this has to take place under strict hygiene. And when 90% of the water before this attack was useless for human consumption, and when after this attack, the Israelis shut off the water pipelines to, to Gaza and the self-sufficient uh, water wells and, and, and lines and, and um, water cleaning purification systems were bombed, uh, most of them. There hasn't been water to provide these hygienical conditions. So even those wounds that could be cleaned were not clean because of the lack of such a basic thing as clean water for the surgeons to wash their hands. In addition to that, because of the siege, they do not have disinfectious uh, solutions like, um, you know, the different types of chemical solutions that we use to disinfect skin and, and wounds. So a large, no, no, 100% of the war wounds are infected. And then for the burns, they may not be infected from the beginning because there's a, such a high temperature, so the bacteria will have been killed. But they are extremely sensitive to infections because the burn will break the, the barrier between the body and the, the environment because the skin is destroyed. And that raw surface with no skin, the burnt surface, is extremely uh, attractive for bacteria if you don't have 
sterile conditions. So the lack of water, the lack of dis disinfectants, and the lack of, you know, sterile gaunts and blows and all of that will cause an extremely high number of infections in the in the wounds for the for the long time. And when you have an infected war wound, as I said, they're all infected, but you can't control that with debridement, then you will need antibiotics and you will need all the classes of antibiotics. First, second, third, fourth generation of antibiotics. You don't have that in Gaza. I have patient cases from my colleagues, children who die from septicemia from 100% survivable injuries, like a lung concussion, like a blast lung. You know that, you know, you can treat it with, with positive pressure ventilation on a respirator, on a ventilator, and you can give IV antibiotics. And, and, and don't forget Palestinian healthcare was before this at normal to high international level of quality. The very academic Palestinian people is the most schooled, the most well-educated people on earth. They have the highest literacy rate on earth. Did you know that? They are the most educated people in the Middle East. Did you know that? Yeah. They have the highest number of master degrees per capita, I think, globally. Right. And I know their institutions. I know I know their research institutions. I've published a lot of research from Gaza. If you do a Google search on my name in Gaza, you can see the studies we've done, of course, always together with Palestinian colleagues. Their research institutes are of highest international standard. So they follow international protocols for treatment, for example, of infectious diseases. So this lack of hygiene, this lack of clean water, this lack of antibiotics, this lack of... of of basic preconditions for a healthcare system are detrimental and are killing maybe more people than the bombing itself. We don't have the numbers. Dr. Yusuf Abarish, the Minister of Health, as I mentioned to you, he said, Dr. Matz, he said in November, no, December, he said, actually, the most dangerous thing now for the people of Gaza is not the bombing. It is the triangle of death. And he defined the triangle of death as starvation, dehydration, lack of water, and diseases. Because the, the starvation, the forced starvation, the man-made collective starvation, and the lack of water are extremely dangerous to human health. That's the precondition. That's, that's the basic needs for all of us. It's food and water. And then you have the diseases of which there is, of course, just as much as in any U.S. population of 2.2 million. There are strokes, there are myocardial infarctions, and of course, under stress, there are more cardiovascular events than in a normal situation. There are the psychiatric disorders. Of course, if you have a paranoid psychosis, I mean, how, how can you sustain that in that horrific environment? There is diabetes, 15.4% prevalence in Gaza. Lots and lots of diabetic patients, lots of young diabetic patients, no cool chain, no insulin. And there are, of course, cancer. More than 10,000 cancer patients in Gaza without any treatment, be it oncological, uh, you know, cytostatic uh, medical treatment or surgical treatment or radiation. Gaza never had radiation treatment for cancer, uh, for cancer patients. They have a sky-high mortality, for example, from breast cancer from before the attack. So these diseases, all the diseases, and then you add on them, as I said, the infectious diseases. And, and, and let me just give you one number on the health. There are currently, according to the last report, and this last report is from the, um, is actually from the 12th of June. Uh, and they report 865,000 cases of acute respiratory infections, 865,000, wow. most, most of them in children. And bear in mind that when you are starved and lack water and lack cleanliness, your immune system is also starved. So you're much more susceptible to infections. There are 485,000 cases of diarrhea, including 113,600 children under five, 114,000 children under five, 
had diarrhea and vomit. What do you need for treatment? Clean water. If you don't have clean water, what do you need? Intravenous, short term, one or two or three days, rehydration. Don't have that, don't have clean water. We don't know how many of these kids are dying from very basic. Yeah, very diseases. basic. And then you have the pregnant women and you have 180 deliveries per day in Gaza. You have, uh, you have, you know, all these pregnant women that try to support their fetus and try to survive without any uh, maternity ward. Of course, there are midwives, but they cannot suffice to, to take care of, of all of them. And um, um, these women, they need, of course, follow-up because they are malnourished themselves. And then the, the fetus is malnourished and they are high-risk deliveries. There are 76,000 cases of viral hepatitis, hepatitis A, which will explode. Now the heat is on in Gaza. The flies are everywhere. The mosquitoes are everywhere because all the garbage have been piling up for half a year because all the garbage trucks have been bombed and destroyed because the sewage cleaning system, which was quite good in Gaza, has been bombed. It's raw sewage pumped out in the Mediterranean and into the, you know, the ditches and the trenches of, of Gaza. So... It is a nightmare public health scenario, man-made. That's that's important. This is this was uh, this is man-made. This is man-made. Uh, I want to do. I want to combine a couple of questions from the chat room for you before we close today. Um, Western governments, particularly the U.S., Western media, particularly the U.S., even the so-called liberal media, um, are captives of uh, uh, Zionism, and uh, particularly Christian Zionism. And maybe you could say a word about uh, why that is so dangerous, uh, even criminal, even heretical, uh, in uh, particularly in the West and particularly in the United States, the role of Christian Zionism and how we should, and, and, and that, we, that we should distinguish it from uh, the rich traditions of Judaism. Because Judaism itself now is captive to Zionism as well. Mm, Michael, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to answer that question. It seems like um, I think uh, it seems like your uh, uh, your audience is much more uh, uh, scholared and, and, and knowledgeable about these. Uh, well, really... a couple of them have asked me to ask you that, and it was particularly yeah. Don Wagner who asked me to ask you that. <laughs> Who's an expert, of course. I, 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 no, no, no. I, I think I think Don is perfectly capable of answering this. I mean, what what is important is, of course, to to retake the narrative, and to resist all these false narratives of what Gaza and Palestine is all about, and that is that takes an army of of honest people speaking truth to power. And I think this audience of, of 39, 41 people who are listening in on, on this conversation, you are that army. I think that Fosna and, and Sabil and, and all these dedicated people in all the religious communities, not only in the Christian camp, but also in the Muslim and in the Judaism camp, are the people who should clarify these uh, deliberate misunderstandings about what this is all about. Well, and the encampments now, we're, we're seeing this now with students rising up and faculty rising up, and, and uh, uh, not only in the U.S., but around the world. But we're seeing it here in this country. The students were leading the way, just like in the civil rights movement. Yeah, it's very promising. I think the solidarity movement, and let me, let me end by an uplifting note. As I said, I've never seen, and I've been working with Palestine since 1981 when I went to Beirut first time. I just came from Beirut, uh, by the way, yesterday or oh, two days ago, from a big conference at the American University in Beirut called, uh, named uh, Justice for Gaza. Lots and lots of good people from all over the world discussing how can we rebuild Gaza, because that's where we need the focus now. Michael, I really want to lift our, our, our eyes and our glance and look forward. How can we rebuild Gaza? I think there are a few important points here to make. Number one, immediate ceasefire, unconditional, long-lasting, immediate ceasefire. Number two, immediate opening of Gaza, unlimited access for the humanitarian convoys uh, under the leadership of you and not Israel. Number three, repair, 
restore and reopen Palestinian healthcare, both hospitals and primary health care. Number four, stop the avoidable death. Immediate treatment of diseases, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and infectious diseases by properly importing enough medical equipment and drugs to supply what is needed and first and foremost support the Palestinian healthcare and then add on international teams. And then uh, the next very important thing I think is increased solidarity. And then that solidarity movement has to understand that number one, any rebuilding effort of Gaza, be it healthcare or schooling or, or, or psychosocial support or, or communication has to be under Palestinian leadership. And the Palestinian people have the right to determine their future and their destination themselves, just like the U.S. people. Now, if you choose Trump as your president and the majority of the people in Canada so much dislike that choice, democratic choice from the U.S. people, that they think it's right to start bombing them, you all know that's wrong. And it's the same with the Palestinian people. We all have the right to choose in democratic elections, which they had in 2006. Flawless uh, elections it was a landslide victory for Hamas. They made a unified government, which was shot down. And then it all started with siege. So the Palestinian people has to be the leaders with the reconstruction. And we have to support Palestinian unity. There is a lot of work going on now to establish Palestinian unity, which is the most dangerous thing of all for Israel and the United States, because Palestinian unity will show the world how strong the Palestinian resistance and the Palestinian people indeed is. And then the last point is, of course, stop defunding UNRWA, support UNRWA, and um, increase the solidarity work and end the occupation of Palestine. I'm a doctor. I treat. I don't treat symptoms. If there is a patient coming to me with chest pain, I can, of course, give pain relief for the chest pain but if i don't examine that patient to exclude a cancer i'm a very bad doctor the root cause of all the misery we see in occupied palestine in the west bank in gaza in the diaspora is the occupation of palestine it has to end there has to be a long-term just solution for the palestinian people an end to israeli apartheid and occupation a dismantling of the settlements also called colonies and the removal and retaction of all the occupiers, also called settlers, which was an integral and important part of the Oslo Accord, which Israel never, ever followed. So let's just start with the Oslo Accord. Let Israel dismantle the settlements. Let's then move back to the 67 border. The 67 border is accepted by Hamas and all the Palestinian different parties. Let's start from there. If we don't get an end to the occupation, we will never do anything else than patch a wounded uh, world and, and, and keep soaking up the blood from the floor without stopping the tap that is shedding all the blood, which is the occupation and the Israeli settler colonial project. Thank you. Well, we want to say thank you to you, uh, Dr. Mads, and, and we want to say thanks to our sponsoring organizations. Mads, do you want to have any closing words for us just to... Uh... Uh, give us our charge. I want to thank you all for listening in uh, from the top of the world, from the Arctic. Uh, I live in Tromsø, which happens to be the northernmost university city in the world and which has been twin city with Gaza City for the last 21, 22 years. We have a municipality council decision in my city, which I'm proud of, to boycott all goods and services from occupied Palestinian territory. That's my city. That's my university city. I want you all to, um, to an, an acknowledge your own solidarity work and the, and the efforts that has taken that that has taken for you to to sort of be a part of through these different years, difficult years and this very difficult last eight, nine months. But I also want you all to discuss with your family, with your friends, with the other ones in your groups, what more can we do to enhance, increase, and expand the solidarity work? Because our tool, it's not armed resistance. Our tool is not killing. Our tool is not resistance. Our tool is with the people of Palestine and other people who are 
And that is a mighty tool. It's not the winning thing. As Nelson Mandela always said, it was the resistance of the South African people, but the support of international solidarity was mandatory to our victory. And as Nelson Mandela also said, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the, of the Palestinian people. And as he also said, no power on earth can stop and press people determined to win their liberty and their freedom. So all of you, thank you so much. Increase the solidarity work. You have the key. The U.S. is the decisive factor. And the, the people of the United States have been willing to change their opinion. We have seen that in the polls. And I urge you all to give yourself a good pat on the back for the work you have done and look forward and start discussing how can we support the rebuilding of Gaza? Because there will, inshallah, be a, a Gaza like a bird phoenix racing from the ashes. And the city arms of Gaza City has been for many hundred years the bird phoenix racing from the ashes and we'll see that happen all together shukraniktir dr maj you're an inspiration and uh, we just simply want to say thank you again for your time today and thank you for your work uh, uh for the people of gaza all these many years